almost like a greenhouse. Really, really fascinating research. So when you begin to study and look at all of these things, you you begin to realize that like a, a, a lot of our current flooding, wind, other problems have their roots in a way of farming and a way of raising food that is antagonistic to how the, you know, the created order was put together and meant to run. And, and we've been kicking the dirt so long that the dirt is starting to kick us back. The Culinary Libertarian Podcast, Episode 42. Yo, welcome to the Culinary Libertarian Podcast, where the philosophy is free, but the food's on you. Hello folks, Dan Reed here, the Culinary Libertarian. Welcome back to the podcast. Happy to have you here. Happy to be here. A few things first. Click over to my podcasts page, culinarylibertarian.com slash podcasts. And there you will see all of the buttons for my social media accounts. You can join me in the Eating Liberty Facebook group. The people there share recipes and techniques for baking as well as some issues of the day pertaining to food which don't fit the narrative you've been fed. You can also follow me on Twitter, Gab, Minds, and Bitbacker.io, as well as subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also help support the show by sharing the episodes on social media. When you see the post for each episode, share that to your page so more people can see that episode. That's very helpful in getting the show to more people, and so too is giving the show a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcatcher, and also leaving a positive review. That moves the show up and lets more people find it. You can help keep the lights on, so to speak, with donations at PayPal, Bitcoin, or Patreon, which are also located on the podcasts page. And for Patreon support, I have got some inducements at the 3 and $5 level. History used to be told by the victor. What was often overlooked was the other story. Those victor stories became rewritten as PC thinking and progressive policies took over textbook writing. Things are so bad, it is hard to know what was the case. When we don't know the past, we are, as the saying goes, doomed to repeat it. Set history right with the courses from my affiliate, McClanahan Academy, with Brian McClanahan. Brian's courses cover American history topics, such as the Declaration of Independence, the Constitutions, Reconstruction, and how Alexander Hamilton screwed up America. Click over to culinarylibertarian.com slash academy for the full list of courses. Learn at your pace and your time and get the full story that has been swept away. culinarylibertarian.com slash academy. Serious history for people serious about history. My guest today is John Moody, former director of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. John is a homesteader on 35 acres in Kentucky. John had seasonal allergies and duodenal ulcers and discovered that the diet of conventional foods was killing him. He and his family transitioned to local foods and local food distribution, and on that 35 acres, he put that learning into practice. He is the author of a number of books, including The Frugal Homesteader Handbook and The Elderberry Book. He is the founder of the Whole Life Buying Club and, with Joel Salatin, is co-founder of the Rogue Food Conference. He speaks across the country at a wide variety of events and conferences, along with writing for numerous publications and websites in the food, farming, homesteading, and health space. Hello, John Moody. Thank you very much for joining me on the Culinary Libertarian Podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. 
Well, it's been a pleasure. It's been, we, we've struggled through some scheduling issues, but we made it work. Uh, so one of the things, I, I first learned of you listening to the Tom Woods show, uh, and that was way back in episode 994 of his show, and you were discussing with him a few things, in particular, uh, some states that are making uh, making food rights something that's important. And it sounds like a crazy thing to say, that we we have to have the law involved in food rights, but yet here we are. So um, you were talking about some same old regulatory nonsense, substitute subsidizing cheap food substitutes. So what's is that still happening? Um, and I guess one of the questions would be, why is cheap food being subsidized and who's benefiting from that? Yeah. Well, you know, maybe quick quick history lesson. Yes. Um, in the in the mid 1900s, the US government adopted a policy of cheap food as of primary importance, um, both domestically and geopolitically. Um, so so th this was a government policy that, uh, you know, some of the slogans from that era that really sum it up are meat as cheap as bread. Um, so, and, you know, get big or get out. Um, by the secretary of the USDA, I believe his name was Earl Butts. Um, so, so basically, the the government committed itself to a particular goal in remaking and reshaping the food system that basically went along with other, you know, big government aspirations post World War II. Um, and and that's why even to this day, you have all kinds of government regulations and subsidies and distortions in food um, that are, that are just you know ludicrous. Like one that came up, I think, in the past couple of years was like um, the raisin quota rule. You know that like American raisin farmers ever since the Great Depression have like operated under a government imposed cartel quota system. Um, and I think one of the farmers finally sued, you know, th there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program as, as the one saying goes. So many of our agricultural and food policies um, have been around since, you know, the great depression and post world war two era. Um, and and it's, it's just like layers and layers of nonsense married to massive government stupidity. Um, you know, take a food like corn. Um, I think the EWG, the Environmental Working Group, tallied up just 18 years of direct subsidies given to corn. And it totaled over $100 billion just to corn. Um so, so you know, you just have it, it's it's a really big, crazy issue when you begin to realize just how deep into our food system the government's um, tentacles reach, and just how much tax money is misspent in so many ludicrous and ridiculous ways in and on the food system. I. I it's it's stunning and almost stupefying. So it, if there was some intention to be doing a positive, surely we've, pa we've passed that need. But what was, do you know, what was the thought that this was something that needed to happen? Well, I, I mean, it was a number, it, you know, like um, there's a number of, thoughts and reasons and, and different people had different agendas. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to be like, this was the one reason they did it. Um, you know, there, there's a number of complex political, social and economic factors. Again, especially coming out of the great depression and world war two that kind of set the stage uh, and you also have, um, you know, the technological advances 
better living through chemistry. Um, and, and you have the social upheavals of the late 50s into the 60s that really culminated in the 70s. It, you know, one of the reasons it's such a hard issue to simplify is basically from 1940 to 1980, America underwent more change than probably, um, you know, most of the history of the world for the previous 1,000 years. It, 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 it's mind blowing to realize that, you know, at the end of 1940, to go from California to Washington, D.C., would have cost you a fortune and would have taken, you know, a couple months. And in 1980, you could get from California to Washington, D.C., from breakfast to dinner. Uh, um, you know, so there's there's just all of these radical changes happening simultaneously. And in the midst of that, um, you know, this idea of we want cheap food, we want to free people from cooking so they can pursue other, um, you, you know, I, it, it really is true. Like um, the 1960s, that era really denigrated the role of women as homemaker. Um, and, and, and some of these traditional skills, um, you know, wh why did women quit breastfeeding? Why were antibiotics so widely adopted without any questioning um, because, you know, the American culture was sold by a mixture of corporate and governmental interests, really just a bunch of half or outright false pieces of information. Um, and, and so the changes to the food system were key parts of that, tr of transforming America. Um, into, you know, and the changes in the educational system that people like Dewey and others envisioned. Um, so, so it's just, it's just a bunch of like interwoven cords, um, that gave us, you know, rampant obesity, skyrocketing degenerative disease rates, and a diverse, multifaceted state by state farm and food economy, um, you know, to basically a handful of corporations control almost every major food that Americans now eat. Yeah, I remember you talking about that. And I've also uh, read works by Joel Salatin and, and, and just how continuing just these, these mega corporations where now beef is not slaughtered by the rancher, it's shipped... <laughs> sometimes for states and states and states just to be butchered, which so it's there, there becomes just a massive web of, of, well, will be just complication and problem. And so one of the things that's interesting to me um, about you is your homesteader. And one of the things that's interesting that I read on your Facebook page, I think you sort of wrote it, maybe a little bit tongue-in-cheek, was <laughs> by the farm, soil not included. So I want to talk about soil, but I also want to just a little bit talk about uh, the Green New Deal, which uh, has got lots of things to be complaining about. But I, it's, it's possible that there are a couple of observations that might be right. And one of them could be that factory farming is a bit of a problem. One of them could be that the soil situation on America's farms is a problem. So someone who has worked hard to make what looks like really fabulous, deep, rich black soil from what wasn't deep, rich black soil, how, how is this basic thing, and I don't mean to belittle soil, but if we go from the ground up, how can, how can we start Fix well, now fixing maybe the wrong word, mending the problem by going back to the basics of farming. Yeah, so you know to go along like since we've been talking about history, especially since you know early 1900s forward, 
I, I'd, I'd have to pull the numbers real quick, but America has lost a mind-boggling amount of its soil. We are talking like hundreds of millions, if not maybe billions of metric tons of soil um, blown away on the wind, washed down the Mississippi and every other major river, um, oxidized into the air, you know, wh whatever process, you know, the, the multifaceted processes that have done it um, are, and are astounding. Um, and, you know, we see all sorts of consequences of this loss of soil. Um, you know, we have hypoxic zones basically at the mouth of every major river in America um, for at least part of hypoxic zones are places where um, basically because of nutrient runoff, excessive nutrients in the water supply causes a massive bloom in algae. The massive bloom in algae um, basically uses up all of the free oxygen in the water and then it causes like everything to die, creating a hypoxic zone. Real fun. Um, you know, like, like some people are familiar with those, but you, you think about like, um, the massive flooding that is becoming more and more common across the United States. And, and you, um, you know, so, so we'll do flooding real quick. First, most people don't understand that. I think it's like every 1% of organic matter in an acre of soil that you know you're we're talking like one percent organic matter, I think it's like three inch in the top three inches over an acre holds I believe it's right around twenty thousand gallons of water, so w when you begin to look around and every time we get heavy rains, it leads to massive flooding, you know America's soils used to be six percent, eight percent, ten percent organic matter. And instead of like three or six inches deep, these soils were one foot, two foot, four foot, six foot deep across the prairies. And now they're 2% organic matter, 1% organic matter. Instead of six feet deep, they're two feet deep or one foot deep. Um, years ago, I got to visit a, fr a friend's farm, U.S. Wellness Meats, one of their farms in Missouri. And his farm, grass-fed beef operation, um, pasture-raised, grass-fed beef, and other animals, basically sits hemmed in on all four sides by corn and soy growers. And where his fence meets his neighbor's fence, um, it, it was the first time I've been to the Midwest, uh, you know, where, where a lot of the worst monocropping happens. But where this grass-fed beef farm's fence met the other farm's fence, his land was over a foot higher. It, it, it was like it, it was a visual picture that I will never forget in my whole life, because um, it, it was just amazing to visually see the difference between agricultural practices that destroy the soil that the farm depends on. And that build the soil that the farm depends on. Um, and, you know, so, so you take things like flooding, and when you begin to understand how soil works, how the hydration cycle works, you begin to go, oh, it begins to make a lot more sense why flooding events are becoming more often and they're becoming more severe. Or you, you, um, you know, consider an issue like um, increasingly damaging straight line winds, um, especially coming from the central part of the country and hitting the center and eastern half of the country. Um, you, you know, like historically farms had windbreaks, um, a, a, a well-designed windbreak of trees cuts the speed of passing wind by half or more. But when you fly over the Great Plains, there's almost no trees left, sometimes for hundreds and hundreds of miles. It is, it is an endless ocean of corn and soy, uninterrupted by trees and other things. There's, you know, 
So we have soils that can't absorb water. We have landscapes that don't slow down surface winds. Um, you can look up something called corn sweat, um, which you know some scientists studied basically how corn, big fields of corn, cause massive surface level temperature rises, almost like a greenhouse. Really, really fascinating research. So when you begin to study and look at all of these things, you, you begin to realize that like, you know, a, a, a lot of our current flooding, wind, other problems have their roots in a way of farming and a way of raising food that is antagonistic to how the, you know, the created order was put together and meant to run. And, and we've been kicking the dirt so long that the dirt is starting to kick us back. Um, hmm. So, you know, so, so hopefully that kind of touches on, you know, what you are looking for. Um, but but it, it, it's, just, it's just amazing. You know, I, I've, I tried a few nights ago to calculate how many um, gallons of water soils across America no longer hold because of loss of soil and loss of soil organic matter. Um, also the fact that, you know, water doesn't infiltrate soils as well anymore either because soils are compacted and have other issues from the constant use of heavy machinery. And, and I just, you know, the numbers just got so big so fast. I was flabbergasted. But, but, and, and then you begin to look at, you know, like these these events, you know, like now it makes sense. It, it makes sense why we keep getting hit by worse and worse events, you know, in terms of weather, flooding, wind, because we've just so degraded our landscapes and nobody really wants to admit it. Is it possible that from year to year, more or less, the amount of water is mostly the same? But the continued degradation of the soil quality makes this problem seem worse. Then the other question I have, which is probably a whole book, how did we get to this point? Yeah, well, to the first one, that's possible. But I think part of what we're seeing is since the soil doesn't hold as much water, um, wet soil acts as like a thermal buffer, you, you know, cause uh, water has, water has the ability to absorb a great deal of energy. And, and so like gr the ground heats up faster and you have more free water now running around the atmosphere. Because again, you know, you, you have 40 to 60,000 gallons of water per acre that should be down in the soil that now has to go somewhere a and it goes into the hydration cycle. Yeah. It, it is. So it's possible that we're still only getting the same amount of water though. Over the past two years, um, basically most of the continental United States has, has broken since they started keeping annual rainfall records. Um, you know, so we're, we're not talking, you know, maybe 150 years of history, but the past 24 months have basically broken all historical rainfall averages for large portions of the United States. Um, so there, there's a lot more water, a um, lot more water kind of moving around out there. Um, and, and how we got here, you still there, friend? Yeah, I'm here. Something, something happened. But... Yeah. So it's the, the timer's still going, so I think we're good. Yeah. Rural people in rural Uzbekistan have better internet than we do, but that, that's a different subject. <laughs> so but but that's the end result of monopolies. Um but you know, the reason our soils are so degraded is because of government subsidies and programs in government funded research at the land grant universities that basically pushed farming methods, again, better living through chemistry, 
um, we don't need plants growing on living soils because we could just use synthetic fertilizers. And so there, there was a great deal of hubris that, that developed in America in the mid-1900s that we're still paying the price for that hubris today. Um, and, and it's very hard to get people off of, you know, that, that they're just so married to these broken systems of farming and food and other things. And the government is so committed to propping up and protecting these systems that, you know, the soil degradation and other things just continue. Well, the current debate, if you could stand to watch more than 10 minutes of it, is, I, I think, a perfect, perfect reflection of the whole idea of whatever problems there are, government's going to fix it, never mind the fact that whatever problems there are were probably caused by government in the first place. So <laughs> that somehow most... I don't want to malign everybody, but it seems we'll just say as a group, we seem to not be able to get off this hamster wheel very easily. Uh, and it's just, it, it's very, very frustrating to, to a lot of us who are looking at this and saying, wait a minute. you." So yeah, it's, it's aggravating. Yeah. It, it's definitely problematic. Well, uh, so can we find any hope that the, uh, Centralized cattle and pork and poultry industries can be changed. I, I think there is an increased level of awareness. Now, I don't know what that really means, but I think more and more consumers are paying attention to the quality of the things that they're buying. But I just spoke uh, on the last episode with a farmer in East Texas, uh, Jerrica Cadman, who we had a nice conversation about arsenic in chicken feed <laughs> and why should you, the consumer, have to go through all of this research to find out whether or not the food you are buying is wholesome? Why should you should have an expectation, I think, that when you go to the store, the food you're going to buy isn't going to kill you? I don't find that to be an outrageous idea. Yet we're finding that there's really a more and more reasons to go to your local farmer and buy from the local farmer. Now, the local farmer doesn't have the benefit of all of the subsidies from the government. So the food is going to cost more. It's going to, and, and that might be true. So it's there, there's a challenge there. Do you, do you see any hope at all that, um, that somehow, in some way, the food power grabbers are going to abdicate their power and and make it at least easier for homesteaders or small ranchers to sell their food to the public without violating one of 300,000 federal laws. Oh, no. I mean, the a few years ago here in Kentucky, some friends asked me to work on some legislation. And... You know, for the most part, I, you know, like you mentioned the debates and I honestly, if it wasn't for the Babylon Bee and other satire sites, I would have even known the Democrats are having a debate because, um, you know, it's just all bread and circuses. And so, um, but a few years ago, my friends convinced me to work on some legislation in our home state in Kentucky. And as part of this legislation, we had to meet, uh, meet with other stakeholders, as they're called. Um, so I drove to Frankfurt, and we had this behind-closed-door meeting with other stakeholders. And me and two of my friends were threatened with physical harm over pushing for a bill that would have granted the most modest and limited of freedom to consumers and farmers to directly transact. So, so no, like the, the, the big, the big corporate government endorsed and protected food machines are not going to give up market share 
without um, without playing dirty. <laughs> so there's a couple of things. I know that uh, I don't know the names of the, of the man, and I don't really want to give him any attention. Uh, in Tennessee, just across the border, uh, one fellow was proposing a bill to make all of the participants in a herd share who didn't actually own the cow uh, make them criminals by participating in that herd share and drinking raw milk. I believe that bill has stalled, but that's that's only one of many, and this has been an ongoing battle uh, for a while, and I don't see that going anywhere. Do you see any hope that voters in in states, not at the federal level, I don't think that's possible, but in the states, in the communities, maybe we start at the local level, in, in your town, in your municipality, and vote for change that way. I mean, if, if we're going to say that we still are some kind of a republic, then let's leave it at the local level. Can change be impacted on that level? Yeah, you know, we, we've seen some promising developments at the state level in states like Wyoming and states like Maine that have passed food freedom, um, you know, food sovereignty, food freedom type legislation. Um, you know, that, that legislation faced significant federal and corporate pushback. Um, so you can go read about how like, it might have been the USDA threatened the entire state of Maine from not being allowed to have any USDA inspected meat over the the Maine Food Freedom Act, and, and, and you know this is where you see how thin how thin our republic is with out of control bureaucratic agencies, you know basically threatening an entire state to toe the line. Or to fit your, you know, or to face basically Armageddon. Mm. So, so there are some promising things happening at the state levels. There's also really bad, dumb things happening at a lot of in a lot of states. Um, you know, so every legislation, every legislative session is a mixed bag of wins and losses. Um, you, you know, but but the hard part is, and and. Till there is really substantial change at the federal level, because the federal level controls so much of the food economy, and you know it's it's controlling forty, fifty, sixty billion dollars a year or more in subsidies, grants, and other things, um, and until the farm bill is you know. The golden calf that is the farm bill is ground into dust. Um, it you know there, there's only going to be uh, you know a lot of the change we're seeing I think is good and important change at the local level, but it does very little to undermine the broken food and farming system that accounts for ninety nine point five seven percent of all dollars spent on food in America. Think about Higgs' term Leviathan, and it doesn't even seem to be, <laughs> it seems insufficient. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, a few years ago, I spoke at a Liberty Group's, um, you know, monthly meeting, and I spoke on, I started my talk with, you know, people get upset when the government regulates their light bulbs or their toilets, Without, without generally realizing that the most heavily regulated and the most distorted part of the entire American economy is food and farming. You know, like, how can you get a hamburger for less than a dollar out of a talking clown head? Why do you even think that a talking clown head is going to give you anything that's actually good for you and your family to eat? other than slick marketing, um, is beyond me. Though as a child, I ate way too much out of the talking clown head. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's madness. <laughs> it is. And it's, so talking with 
people like Jerrica and people like you and, and and people who are growing their own food, it's, it provides at least, you know, I, I don't want to say the illusion of hope because I think hope is a real thing. You know, it reminds me of, you know, Shawshank Redemption. So I think we, I think we have ways there. It's interesting that in my state of Oregon, which is in the news uh, every day now for their cap and trade uh, bill, and they've met a, a fierce level of resistance uh, for some reason in Oregon, you can collect rainwater and kids can sell lemonade at a lemonade stand. So, while those two things don't equal out at all, it's nice that at least it's there. Living in the high desert, I'm not worried about collecting rainwater because I don't have any rain. Well, I, I, I like this. I want to talk more about this, but I also want to give you a chance because aside from being well-informed and I, I, you still, uh, forgive me, I don't remember the name of the group that you are either in charge of or with that's doing this legislation stuff. Well, once upon a time, I was executive director for the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. That's the one. Uh, yeah, but I left Farm to Consumer, I guess it might be almost three years ago now. It's hard to remember exactly, you know, it's like two and a half years-ish. Um, so so it's been a number of years since I, um, I, I've had a bunch of people approach me and suggest that I start an organization to work on these issues. Um, it, it, uh, the stars have not aligned for, for that to happen, even though there's been a tremendous amount of interest and there, you know, there's clearly a need for it. Um, right. But, you know, so, so for the most part, I've spent most of the past couple years, um, getting involved on an as need basis, helping farmers who are being harassed. It's, it's not uncommon for me to get a phone call at like 10 at night from a farmer somewhere in the country who's being harassed by government bureaucrats. Um, and, you know, d dealing with things in my home state's legislator and the stupidity that often comes out of there. And trying to get some books done and just enjoying some time with my family. <laughs> well, so that's the other thing I wanted to do, talk about was I know that you have, uh, in addition to building soil for your farm, you have established a flower business for one of your kids. You've got, uh, you're, you're building, a, <laughs> if I may be so bold, a bit of an elderberry empire. Um, yeah. You've got another book in, pro in progress with your wife, for, for baking. So you've got a lot going on. So what else is happening in the Moody household these days? Um, so I wish we had an elderberry empire because then I'd be talking to you from a different location that I am now. Cause we'd, we'd already uh, be ready to move. We do have a, a, a really solid start on an elderberry business. Um, and we're definitely hoping that this year, we can expand the elderberry business substantially because at some point I have to do that, make, make some sort of money thing again. Oh yes. There's that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It, and, you know, elderberry has been great. I, over the winter, I wrote a book all about elder elderberry. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited because that book I guess is just, you know, about two months from when it'll come out. Um, and so I'm taking pre-orders for the book. Also, I mean, you know, for the elderberry business, we're in the middle of, um, you know, trying to go through all the hoops of, you know, having a fully legitimate business in the eyes of the government. Mm. And, you know, that just, um, you, you know, you'll find this interesting, but a couple weeks ago, I set aside a Monday to make a phone call to the agency in Kentucky that's supposed to like be able to help me, you know, figure out how we go about certified kitchen space, blah, 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 blah. And after four hours and like 14 different phone calls, um, it like I had to talk with 11 different agencies and like two dozen different people not to even like, like, like it, it's such a bureaucratic nightmare that I actually was referred to an agency 
that all this agency does is help you get grant money and give you grant money and help you work through all of the requirements of all the other agencies. <laughs> I, I mean, um, you know, it, it's, it's just like, um, and, and what really irritates me is especially coming, you know, our state is now considered a red state because it went all red over the last few election cycles. Um, but so-called limited government Republicans, you know, complain about people being on public programs so, so vehemently at times. But like in my home state of Kentucky, if you want to try and get off of government programs by building a business, it is basically impossible. It, it is a bureaucratic regulatory nightmare to do any. And so, you know, I just, I just, you know, look at them and I'm just like, you all are either fools, hypocrites, evil, or some combination of the above three. Yeah. I think it's a D all the above. So, you know, so it's just like, it, it, it drives me crazy um, because there's so many people in our state like me who, um, you, you know, we're just like, we would like to have thriving businesses where we provide well-paying jobs to people in our communities who need them. And when you have to deal with 14 different agencies to make a bottle of elderberry syrup to sell across state lines, well, now you know why there's so many people on your government programs instead of working. Mm, well, yeah, never mind the fact that there's so many government employees who are on the public dole. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it, you know, it's um, it's Parkinson's law. So <laughs> and if you're not familiar with Parkinson's law, you know, you could go look it up. We can talk about it next time. <laughs> so the, the law of bureaucratic growth. No, oh, yes. Well, that's probably another episode also. Well, one of the things I wanted to just, it, it, there's probably no resolution to it, but one of the things that I'm curious uh, about from your uh, take is the um, uh, uh, the f um, Filburn case the, the, and, and how interstate commerce, are you having any issues with that? Do you, is that still coming up as a problem? for small farmers and homesteaders for even wanting to well yeah because like um our entire food system in terms of over regulation it's wicker versus Philborn that is the legal basis you know I'll, I'll give you a modern example of it um technically the fda and the usda shouldn't be able to rate you know harass farmers in a state who are only selling within that state, theoretically. So there was a farmer a few years ago, a cheesemaker, um, who wasn't letting the FDA or somebody inspect them because the farmer said, our animals are only, you know, our animals are reared only on our farm. We raise the feed for our animals on our farm, and we only sell the cheese we make from the animals on our farm inside of our home state. And because this farmer was buying their salt and their packaging for their cheese from out of state, the FDA and USDA said, because of Wicker versus Philborn, blah, 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 you know, like it, it's Leviathan. You, you know, they're always, always going back to these ridiculous precedents, especially from the early 1900s and mid 1900s to justify continued harassment and insanity. Well, and that insanity is all that it is. It can't mean, it can't be for any other reason than to just be a thug and, and, and demand payment. And somehow paying your, <laughs> paying Tony Soprano, which in the good graces till the next time they show yeah. up. Yeah, and again, you know, that's why P Parkinson's law basically points out um, that the reason bureaucracy has to grow is because the only way a bureaucrat can advance 
is by advancing the number of people he gets to regulate. Because that's the only way he can justify having more underlings beneath him. Uh, it, it, it's a really fascinating read and explains why regulators um, never, ever want to deregulate. You know, it's partly because, generally speaking, those in government, I, I forget who made the observation that, you know, government tends to attract the worst type of people for the jobs. Um, you, you know, the Dolores Umbridges of the world, if you've read the Harry. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm well familiar with Dolores Umbridge. Yes. Yeah. Well, 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 it's really, I, what's, you know, since, since I took, since I went no holds barred on the right, I'll now take my pot shot at the left. But what kills me is, you know, the Harry Potter books are like universally beloved by progressives even though they paint a picture of government as being beyond corrupt and inept in, in ways that are unimaginable. Um, and the average progressive, though you know, a lot of people on the right fit the Dolores Umbridge profile to a T as well, but, but you know, Dolores Umbridge goes about making people's lives miserable because it's for their own good. Mm -hmm. Because he knows what's best. And I'm just like, that sounds a whole lot like Google and Facebook and a lot of the rhetoric you hear coming out of the left. Um, you, you know, so that that's that's the worst part to me. And like Rawlings is a big government defender. And I'm I'm like, do you see the picture of government you painted in your books? <laughs> So, so the the disconnect there is startling to me. That you know that 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 I mean, there's almost nothing redeeming at all about the government in the Harry Potter books, up up and down, floor to ceiling. <laughs> um, and yet we're going to continue go on advocating for more government. Well, that wasn't real government. So, uh, unfortunately, that that was all too real government in, in terms of like a accurately portraying how government in the real world actually functions and what it accomplishes. Well, yeah, it accomplishes next to nothing, but all right, I want to shift gears a little bit and I'm going to go into a little short question and answer series. And if you've ever seen the inside the actors studio TV show uh, at the end, he asks those questions Formed by Bernard Pivot, well, I've manipulated them a little bit to make them more suitable to my show, and then we're going to get into how we can find your how we can find your book. So to begin with, of the five flavors, bitter, salty, sour, sweet, and umami, which one is your favorite? Oh, who doesn't answer umami? Though, though I think it's an unfair question. How so? Because because the flavors are meant to go together. You know, like, um, what is salty with, you, you wouldn't really appreciate saltiness if it wasn't for sweetness. Um, so, but, you, you know, I'd, I'd say umami. Okay. Um, what is your favorite food? Oh, that's a tough one. Then I have to say cookies. So Interesting. What is your least favorite food? Oh, I'm, I don't know. I haven't eaten enough foods to know what my least favorite one is. Though I really, I strongly dislike um, Italian food, like spaghetti sauce, pizza and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan. I'm going to suggest. And I know I might have just irreparably harmed our relationship. No, not at all. Um, and you're going to like this. And this will tie in with your project with your wife. Um, go back, and if you have time, listen to my uh, episode with Peter Reinhardt and make a Detroit-style pizza with the Levan-style dough. And I think, if, if you, even if you still don't like pizza after that, that's fair. But it, most pizza is to be detested, that's fair. But give this one a shot. <laughs> Whole different ballgame. Completely different. Okay. Like, holy, it's amazing. I had no idea. Um, so it's worth a shot. What gets you excited? Oh, what gets me excited? Um, the Rogue Food Conference gets me excited. 
it's a project Joel and I are working on that um, will start getting publicity in the next couple weeks now that we have all the details in order. Um, my kids get me excited. Oh, the thought of like, hopefully being able to move in a couple years and have cattle again gets me excited. That sounds nice. Although the packing does not sound nice. Judo oh, gets, God. yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you got to pay the price somehow. Ju judo gets me excited. And because I'm a dad to five kids, bedtime <laughs> always gets me excited. Oh, yes. What turned you off? Um, oh, stupidity, hypocrisy, mm. um, bravado, um, waste. So, it, 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 like, um, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is where, you know, the Apostle Paul says that we want to live peaceful and quiet lives working with our hands. Um, and, you know, so basically that's like, that's what I, you know, my ideal day is like, I wake up, I go and do chores and check on animals. I read with my kids. I work around the farm and house. Um, I interact with friends like you and, and people who make that difficult or impossible make me unhappy. <laughs> that sounds like a pretty nice day. So what sound do you love? Um, I love the sound of guitar. Um, I played guitar for like, I guess 20 some years. Um, so I love the sound of a guitar, especially like Phil Kagi playing and certain styles of guitar. Um, I just find mesmerizing. Um, and I, I especially love the sounds of early spring. So I, I think though that's, you're not really a homesteader or a farmer if you don't just like adore the sounds of early spring after winter. The first birds, um, the first time that when the wind rustles through the trees, it's not clanking branches, but it's gently rustling leaves. Um, so I think, cause, cause I think it's you the sound don't have to be a farmer or a homesteader to appreciate those sounds. Those are good sounds. Yeah, well, well, they're the sounds of hope. Oh, I like that. Um, you know, because like, because because that's what spring is. Every spring, um, you know, like I I don't know if it was. I'm sure many people have remarked, but you can't be a farmer or a homesteader and not have hope because you basically run around with little rock hard things in your hands and you stick them in the ground. And through some sort of magic, you think they're going to provide like food and other stuff to you and your loved ones and community. Um, so, 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 and you know, and you're hoping that no animals will eat them and you're hoping no storms will destroy them. And um, so to be a farmer or a homesteader in a very real sense is to operate in the economy of hope. I think that's fabulous. What sound do you hate? Traffic. Um, <laughs> the, the, the sound of the yeah, city. Well. So, like, my children, um, like, well, what, you know, when I travel and, I, and speak at conferences and, um, or when we have to go up to Louisville um, and stay overnight on occasion, my kids always remark on both how, like, noisy just gratingly noisy the city is even at night and how glaringly bright it is, um, you know, all the time. Yeah, I, I, I lived under the G train in Brooklyn and it, it took a while to, get, to not hear the subway screeching all the time. It was, yes, I, I'm well acquainted with this situation. Yeah. What is your favorite food indulgence? Um, I don't know if this question applies to me because I can basically eat whatever I want with impunity. It is, if it's good, healthy food, I'm actually trying to gain 10 pounds. <laughs> um, oh, so for you, I, I know. So like um, I've been eating two to three 
um, coconut bliss organic ice cream sandwiches a week on top of eating an extra meal a day. Um, and it's like all been in vain. I've, I've actually like lost a little bit of weight while adding an additional 5,000 calories a week into my diet. <laughs> John, I can assure you, not all of us have this problem. Oh, I know. Like, it's one reason I rarely talk about it because I know, like, the average person, if they, it, you know, they'd want to, like, stab me repeatedly with a sport. Um, have some terse words for you. Okay. Yeah. The um, Elderberry book, you mentioned pre orders. Is that available as a pre order on Amazon? You can pre order on Amazon, or if you want to get it directly from me, um, I can, you know, I'll give you the link. You can put it in the show notes. I set up a Google form to take pre-orders. Okay. Um, so, because like, you know, your audience may or may not know this. Um, it Like when you buy a book from Amazon, it still helps an author. Um, but when you buy a book directly from an author, it's similar to like when you buy food directly from a farmer. <laughs> right. It's it's the difference between the farmer getting a nickel and the farmer getting a quarter. Um, okay. it, it's just like a, a really substantial difference. But if you get it on Amazon, you won't hurt my feelings. Uh, but if you get it directly from me, I'll sign it. And you'll also get some other fun stuff along with the book. Okay, well, I will put links to both of those on the show notes page for today, which would be culinarylibertarian.com slash 42. Um, if people want to learn how in their community to either establish or repeal cottage laws, how should they get started? Oh, well, you know, like, um, we're going to have this rogue food conference in January. So if they can make the conference, it's going to be, if you're somebody who like, um, is passionate about these issues this conference is going to be all about innovative ways and innovative people who are doing really amazing things um, to make local real food possible um, while, you know, dodging the regulatory cartel. Um, so, you know, sounds we're, awesome. Oh, oh, it's like some of the speakers we have coming um, are, are just like, I'm so excited to hear some of these people speak, but, you know, because like, um, you know, there's a lady coming from, I believe she's in Oregon. She founded the Portland meat cooperative because I guess she really wanted to do local meat and she did not have $3.5 million to build a USDA inspected butchering facility. So she founded this educational cooperative that has allowed her not to fall under USDA oversight and do meat butchering and value add it and all this really awesome stuff. Um, and then there's a lady from North Carolina who really wanted to do health education and offer real food to her community. And so she founded a 501c3 food church. You know, so, so she took like the protections of a not-for-profit and the protections for a church and mash them together into something totally new to do local food distribution and try and escape the over, you know, the overreach and oversight of, of the food authorities. Um, so, so it's going to be a, a, a wild, a wild day, <laughs> um, you know, cause we're, we're hoping to educate people on some options that are out there but inspire people to, you know, what ideas can you come up with that would make, biz, you know, businesses or farms more viable and change possible? That is very, very cool. And you said that's you and uh, Joel are working on that? Yeah. So Joel approached me about the idea. I think it was about three years ago he first mentioned it to me. And then last when he and I were both speaking at a conference together, he said he finally had the bandwidth for us to really begin moving 
moving the project forward. Um, so the conference is going to be January 25th, 2020, um, at the Cincinnati airport, which is here in Kentucky. Um, okay. Uh, is there a link for that that I can put up on the show notes page? Yeah. Well, and you know, the, the website for the conference is rogue food conference. Okay. Um, and go ahead. Yeah. And that, that's just, you know, the website should be like the, you know, into next week, we're getting all kind of like the final stuff knocked out. Um, so I don't know how soon you'll be posting this, but, but basically by the end of the first week of July, um, we'll be totally ready to go. Excellent. Well, that should work out well. And how can people follow you and your farm? You have a website that people can uh, keep track of you on? Uh, they could friend me on Facebook, and I've been trying to decide what I'm going to do website-wise. You know, we have the Abbey's Elderberry website. Um, so that's one way you can support, stay in touch with us, is um, because, you know, the Elderberry website probably gets the most traffic of any of our websites. And okay. I need to spend some time figuring out what to do in terms of website and branding. <laughs> so, well, excellent. Well, I will put those up. You could friend me on face, you know, friend me on Facebook, friend me on me. We, um, okay. So I, will put both I don't use up. me. We much, um, but it's, you know, me, me, we is my backup for when I inevitably get like, Tossed off Facebook for having non. Yes, everyone opinions. has one, and uh, Minds is the other popular place, and so is Gab. But yeah, every, everyone's got a <clears throat> excuse me. Everyone has a contingency plan for what seems to be an inevitable <laughs> act. Yep. All right. Well, John, thank you very much for your time. I I know we you just finished lunch. I heard the Civil War a little while ago, so it's probably on to more farming stuff. But thank you for taking time out of your day today to talk to me. Man, thank you so much for having me. So I'm I'm just really glad you've been so patient for us to finally be able to make well, this happen. Well, it was meant to be now, so that's how it goes. So have a great afternoon, and we'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks, friend. You're welcome. Bye-bye. All right, folks, that's going to do it. Links to John's books and his Facebook page will be on today's show notes page, culinarylibertarian.com slash 42. Building up soil can't be easy. Even gardening on my back porch and the wee backyard can be a challenge. But if farming or even gardening on your back porch is something you want to learn to help feed your family better food, then click over to my Amazon affiliate page with some of their homesteading and gardening books. Not all of them, but some of them. And that's culinarylibertarian.com slash homesteading or click the banner on the show notes page. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon. Music for the Culinary Libertarian Podcast is provided by Matthew Bankert at mattbankert.com.